Greetings all. Okay, I'm going pure op-ed for this one for no reason other than it's time for me to add my weight to the great internet debate on Tiger. I thought it would be a good time right now for me to make my personal position on the subject clear. And this may or may not come as a surprise to those of you who watch my videos, but I submit that Tiger was actually a pretty good tank. There seems to be two predominant schools of thought on Tiger. One is that the tank was the greatest weapon in the world, and the other it was a complete waste of metal. Well, guess what guys, if you're on one of those two sides, you're wrong. Uh, like many other things, the reality is far more nuanced than such simplicity. One of the important things to remember about Tiger is that it was developed with a very clear intent in mind. And I'll hop over to Hilary Doyle again. Well, Germany had, uh, up till about 1942, when the political influences started to appear, had a very clearly defined system for uh, tank development. They had, in the Waffenamt, they had an inspectorate whose job it was to draw up the specifications of what was required. So they would discuss with the various uh, people involved in, in the requirements, and then they would issue a specification. That specification then was sent to a number of uh, companies in the industry to come back with uh, relevant designs meeting those specifications. And then, completely separately, there was a procurement office who looked after the purchasing of this stuff and allocating the money to it. So as long as that system held up and wasn't interfered with, you had a very clearly defined, we need such and such a vehicle, it has to have the following characteristics, and you got a good mixture of uh, armor, gun, and so forth for the period. Well, the, the Tiger One is, uh, is part of uh, the program where there was a uh, requirement for that. That was uh, basically a requirement that was drawn up in, I think, about 1938 for a heavy breakthrough tank. Interesting, Ken was talking about this coming from the Marine Corps, but the German army perceived that they needed a number of different levels. The main battle tank would have been the Panzer III, supported by a Panzer IV, and then they needed a breakthrough tank, a heavily armored, well-equipped uh, vehicle, and that's the Tiger I. It just happened to evolve into the vehicle that it, it uh, came as in the end, but there was a whole series of test vehicles leading up to that. This immediately differentiates Tiger from a number of other monster tanks, such as the Char B1, which was developed as something of a pet project, but without the French Army's doctrinal team actually laying out an intent for it. B1 was more of an engineering exercise as to what sort of a tank could be built, whereas Tiger was built with a clear goal in mind, and generally speaking, it was also being built by professionals. So you need to hop back to 1937 and the Dirk Berkswagen. It translates basically as breaching vehicle, or as we would now consider it, a breakthrough tank. Coming in at 30 ton, this was, compared to the Panzer 3 and 4, already something of a heavy tank. The 5 centimeters of armor, to include turret side armor, may not seem like much now, but bear in mind that none of the Panzers had anything over 3 centimeters, and most had less. The gun was to be the short 7.5, as found on Panzer IV. By 1940, the basic Henschel Tiger hull is already taking shape in the form of the VK-3001, complete with interleaved double-wheel torsion bar suspension, although with return rollers. The turret could not really be upgraded, though, to take a larger gun. Turret development came a little bit out of left field, and the original idea for what would become the VK-3601 turret was to mount a 10.5cm L28, in late 1939, but by July 1940 it was considered that Panzers of over 30 tons will be of limited use given the experience in France and bridge limitations. There seemed to be little choice though. For a breakthrough tank it would have to have 8 centimeters of armor and thus a weight of at least 36 tons. The weapon was to be the 7.5 centimeter taper board and the vehicle was named the Panzerkampfwagen 6 Ausführung B. However, strategic concerns then got involved, and it turned out that the Germans did not have enough tungsten to put the vehicle into serious production. Basically, they couldn't make the ammunition. This meant, as a result, that other options had to be found, and there was some consideration given to the high-velocity long 7.5-70 and the shorter 8.856 with the larger HE round. In either case, both would require a bigger turret, and to make matters worse, Hitler insisted in May 41 that now at least 10 centimeters of frontal armor was required. 
the tank's weight was thus beginning to increase. The indecision to use the 8.8 .8 was something of an accident. The L70 was actually the preferred choice because it met the armour penetration requirements whilst being a smaller round and thus allowing greater ammunition capacity. A similar preference philosophy as the US would have later in the war. However, because Porsche's tank wasn't working, and 8.8cm gun turrets for that already existed, the Henschel tanks started being fitted with the 8.8cm guns. After those 90 tanks were built, the run would then change to the Panzer VI Asferung H2 with the long 7.5. The 8.8 .8 was not capable of meeting the requirement of penetrating 10cm of armour sloped at 30 degrees at 1400 meters. However, it did turn out that a redesign of the 8.8 .8 AP shell was able to make the requirement. And since the 8.8 .8 was going to start getting installed into Tigris by the end of 1942, there seemed little point in changing the production line to 7.5 centimeter turrets after 90, and also the stowage, for half of a year. So Tiger is built was actually something of an accident, with the unexpected gun combined with a turret intended for another tank. That did not mean though that it did not meet the requirements. But how about all of Tiger's known faults? Was it too heavy? Yeah, hence the snorkeling requirement. It's not as convenient as being lighter, but at least it's an option, even though it does add complexity. Was it tough to tow? Yeah, and the Germans were well aware of it. They even had started a program of recovery vehicles specifically to tow the vehicle, although in the end, granted, it was never implemented. Did it require a lot of man hours to repair? Yes and the Germans added manpower to the maintenance units to compensate. Though for some reason they never built enough spare parts. To put this in perhaps a more modern analogy, consider the common complaint about the M1 Abrams, the fuel consumption, which in fairness has been addressed in the last decade or so by the APU. Many armies cannot afford to field the amount of fuel trucks and fuel that a fleet of M1s would uh, require. The US can. If the US, as it did, believe that the capabilities of the M1 tank were sufficiently advanced over the competitor designs that it was worth fielding those extra resources, it is entirely possible that two different armies could both correctly conclude that the tank was a good tank and the other one that the tank was not a good tank. The catch though is in planning and equipping for the known concerns. So back to Tiger. Its main faults were operational mobility caused by the weight and reliance upon trains and snorkeling, and the amount of time it took to maintain. But the Germans were well aware of this when they created their doctrine. Tiger was not designed to be a main tank, it was to be used for the breakthrough role. This meant, thus, that there was normally a modicum of time permitted for movement to wherever it was that the heavy tank battalion was needed, so the operational mobility limitations are not much of a concern. Further, since it was only to be used for breakthroughs, not many of the tanks needed to be manufactured, so the man-hour time requirements and cost per tank could be considered worth it, especially when you consider how many lesser tanks might be lost performing the same breakthrough role. But creating a breakthrough doesn't require a large portion of the overall battle, so once the hole has been punched and the medium tanks move forward, there should be no further use for the Tiger. It can then be pulled to the rear and there should be ample time available for the maintenance to be performed. It might take three times as long for the Tiger unit to be fully operational again, just by the nature of the tank's requirements and its design, but that isn't the concern of the battalion commander. What he is concerned about is that the next time that his heavy battalion is called forward to punch the next breakthrough at the next defensive line, his operational readiness rate is such that all his tanks are available. Now, don't get me wrong. I can point to a number of flaws in Tiger's design from the crewman's perspective, going from the limited gunner's vision through the lack of a ready rack. Still, for 1942, it was a heck of a tank, you know, liabilities notwithstanding, and most importantly, in the little niche that the tank was designed for, as part of the larger army, it was perfectly well suited for the job. The problem comes when people try to take it out of this niche and try to apply it to situations for which it was never intended in the first place. No piece of equipment is going to be successful if used for something for which it was not designed. Being used as the fireman of the Eastern Front means that it's being used in a reactive situation. Instead of moving to a new location in their own time and routing, and then maintaining, and then fighting, and then maintaining again as the battle moves forwards, 
The tanks are instead racing to the next trouble spot and then fighting and then maintaining if they can. If they have to fall back, well then the maintaining is just going to have to happen even later. Uh, assuming that the tank actually gets that far. And since it's being used everywhere possible, the longer amount of time and maintenance required is going to cause even more trouble and decrease the OR rating because the battalion CO needs his tanks now, not in three times as long. This is not the tank's fault, nor is it the fault of the tank designers. It's the fault of an army high command which has bitten off more than it can chew and is now using every tooth it has, no matter how well suited. Once the army had to abandon the doctrines for which his equipment was designed, it had become a matter of desperation, and Tiger comes out the worst because of it. So there you go. As ever, I do urge people to look at the larger picture, but uh, in this case, in my two cents worth what you paid for it, two cents, maybe, good tank, but overtaken by subsequent events. And now to the admin side of the video. You will have noticed that the long-awaited Significant Emotional Event t-shirt now exists. Now I am open to ideas as to what other things and t-shirts you might want, by the way, so I'm not sure if we can really make a mug out of this, but yeah, put, put an idea for some merchandise you know, in the comments and whatever gets significant upvotes I'll take a look at. Uh, there have been requests for reissues of the previous t-shirts, uh, stay tuned. Uh, some of the Patreon and subscribe star tiers do get t-shirts at cost value. So if you are one of those, shoot me a message on Patreon or subscribe star and I will sort you out. If you didn't know I have a Patreon, you do now. And while I'm flogging things, Can Openers is still available on Amazon as well. And if you're in Europe, uh, Panzer Rex. If you're in Canada, the Ontario Regiment Museum. So that is it for now. I will see you on the next one. Take care.